Welcome. We're going to start off chapter one by talking about matter and some of its properties. So when you look here in the notes, it says chemistry is the study of matter. So maybe the first question we might have is, well, what is matter? It seems like a word we would all know, but what does that mean? So my favorite definition is right here, and this is uh, from Bill Nye the Science Guy, and it says that matter is the stuff that things are made of. So when we study matter, we're studying what things are made of. Now, the second sentence here in your notes, this is how we can in science define a stuff a little bit more as anything that has mass and takes up space. So we're going to study the things that the stuff or what things are made of. Now, to be sure we understand, when we talk about what things are made of, they uh, can have different sources. So some things just naturally occur in um, our environment, and then other things are man-made, which we would call synthetic. Now, whether you're something that occurs naturally in the environment or whether you're synthetic, it still is considered to be matter. And in chemistry and throughout the course, what we're going to study about matter is defined right here. We're going to just study its composition, so what it's made of, some of its properties, and then transformations, which is really like reactions and what it does. So one thing that I always think uh, is an important part of matter and that I expect most students know before they come to this class are the states of matter. So when we talk about a state of matter, or if a homework question or exam is asking about the states of matter, it's one of these three things, a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now if I wrote over here, so a solid, there's a few things that we can uh, just think about initially about solid, liquids, and gases. We actually go into more details in a later chapter. But two of the things that we think about with uh, the different states are their volume, or how much space they take up, and their shape. So solids, they have a, a definite volume. And the volume is how much space you take up. So if you have a definite volume, it means that no matter where you put it, that it keeps its same, it takes up the same amount of space. It keeps its volume. It also, solids can have sh uh, a definite shapes that they maintain, which means that I, I can take a, a solid, like I could take a stapler, and I could take it from one part of the room, I could put it into a another part of the room, or into a different container, or into a drawer, and it would still uh, make that shape. Oh. My pen is, every time I try to make the E, the, um, it's trying to copy something. Um, so it maintains its shape. So if you look at any of the solids in your room uh, or the, that place where you're sitting, just look around. And if something's a solid, it's going to take up a definite amount of space no matter where you move it. And it will also keep its shape. Now, liquids... If we think about their volume, well, they maintain their volume as well. They have a definite volume. My example for this is always thinking about cooking. So let's say you have a recipe and it takes a quarter cup of oil. Now, a cup is not a, 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 a measurement we use in science, but it is something we understand as a measurement of volume. And if we have a quarter cup of oil um, that's called for in our recipe, so we measure it out in a measuring cup, and then we pour it into the bowl, and we notice it looks different, like it doesn't keep its shape, but at the same time, we know it's still a quarter cup. It didn't expand or contract, but it just stays there, and it has this definite volume. The volume amount of space is taking up. It doesn't change. But what we do, do know is that it has taken on the shape of the container, right? So depending on where I put my liquid, it will take on whatever shape that liquid has. I mean, sorry, that container has. Now, it doesn't fill up the container, right? It doesn't expand into the container. It's just if the bottom of the container is round, the liquid looks round. If it's a, a flat bottom, it would look flat. 
And then finally, our third state is our gas. So when we think about uh, the volume and the shape of a gas, well, gases expand to whatever container you have. So both of these, they have the volume and the shape of whatever container that you put it in. So it is expanding to this uh, container. Now, when we think about it, why could this possibly be? Like, what's the difference if I had a solid liquid and a gas? Let's think of I of water. So you could have ice, water, and steam. They all consist of H2O, the compound water. So they're not changing what substance they are, but why are they going from a solid, a liquid, to a gas? Well, one thing, if you think about how would you get an ice cube to melt to water and then to create it to steam, you'd add heat. Well, heat is a form of energy, and so basically what's happening is you're increasing the amount of energy that the particles have as they go um, from a solid, a liquid, a gas, and that changes how they interact with each other. So when we look at the particles, which is how we want to explain some of these things, what it's made of, um, solids are very close together in regular uh, 3D arrangements. Now, not all solids have regular repeating patterns. We'll learn a little bit more about that later. But they have this nice close together relationship uh, uh, arrangement, and those particles don't move very fast. Like they probably vibrate and wiggle, but they don't move past one another. But now if we increase the energy of the particles, we give it a little bit more energy. Now it turns into a liquid. And those liquid molecules, while they're still relatively close together, they have, uh, have a little bit more energy. And so those attractions between the molecules are a little less important. And now the particles can slide past one another. And so how do we see this when we look at a liquid? We see that it pours, and it will just pour freely from one thing to another. Um, it doesn't, they don't really escape from each other. They stay together as a group because they're still attracted. But the extra energy allows them to move past one another. And then finally, we get to the gases, which has the most energy in its particles of them all. And the gas molecules move very fast. And so they're moving randomly and fast and, and quickly. And so um, the attractions they had for each other when they were in a liquid and a solid state are not very important anymore because they're moving so fast. And so they move so fast that they move uh, far apart from one another. They move randomly, and this allows them not to stay right next to each other, but to fill the entire container. So when we think about the particles and their energy and how they're related to each other and their attractions, we kind of begin to understand why solids, liquids, and gases have, um, some of them have definite volumes and some of them um, maybe have volumes of the containers as well as we can think about their shapes. So that's one thing about the state of matter is one thing that characterizes it. Is it a solid, liquid, or a gas? And in chemistry, again, we try to understand a little bit more about the particles, what it's made of. Another thing that we can characterize matter by is some of its properties. Now on the notes, um, the other ones are going to be on the next page, but you see down here, the first thing I have right here, it says physical properties. And so when I'm looking at physical properties, um, and I'm wanting, uh, wanting to think about physical properties, it says, a physical property, and here's this word physical, that's going to be key to me, observed or measured without changing the composition of the substance. So what this is telling me is that I could look at it and it wouldn't change into a new substance. It would be the same substance, but I could tell you something about it. So for example, I could look at an ice cube and I could tell you that it is solid. So the state of that ice cube is a physical property because I can observe it and I, I'm not changing this, still water, it's still H2O, but I can tell you something about it. Um, I could look at a flower and I could say, oh, that flower is yellow. And that would be a physical property of that particular flower because I'm not changing it, I'm just observing it. So we also can have things that are physical changes. So here again is that word physical. And here we go, physical. Now change means that something is going to happen. 
So it says you alter the substance. So there's the change. That's what the word change means. But look here again, without changing its composition. So here, this is when something changes, but it doesn't change what it is. Okay, so it still changes. So let me give you an example, and then we're going to kind of make a little list of physical properties and physical changes. So, uh, for example, if that ice cube I was just talking about turns into water, it melts, that's a physical change, right? It's still water, but it's gone from being a solid to a liquid, so it's altered, but it's still water, so I, it's the composition is not changed. So down here you see... Things that are physical have no change in composition. So let's make a little list. So here I'm going to have physical properties. And I'll just brainstorm. There's going to be more than I'll have right here, but just to give you ideas. So we said it's state. These are things we can observe or measure without changing the substance, I can measure anything like its length, its mass, its volume. These are all physical because I would not, I would just measure it. I wouldn't change the substance. Um, I, we could do its color. I could see its color. I could tell you what it smelled like. I could tell you its texture. Um, we'll learn later. I'll write it down here, but we'll learn about density. That would be physical. I can measure that without changing it. Um, what are some other things? I could tell you, does it conduct electricity? I could tell you. Um, what else? Well, that's all that's sitting in my head right now. But those are some of the ideas. You might be thinking of others, uh, other uh, examples. And if I think of something else, I'll put it on the list. Now, physical changes really are only two categories. Remember, these are things that something's going to change, but the substance stays the same. So the first category is a change in state. This is the most common physical change. So words that might describe this are things like melting, uh, freezing, uh, condensation or condensing. I don't. It doesn't matter if you're using the ing or not. Um, what else do we do? We melt. We freeze. We condense. Evaporating. Uh, the one that if you, there's one that you might not have, whoops, there's one that you might not have heard before, sublimation, uh, that is when you go from a gas, to sublimation is when you go from a gas, uh, sorry, a solid directly to a gas, and the opposite of that is the word deposit, dimension. um, so those are all words that describe changes in state. And there's some other ones, like vaporizing is it would be another one. But just to give you an idea, this is not an extensive, uh, exclusive list. It's just some ideas. So physical changes. Oh, and that made me think. A physical property I want to add here, melting point and boiling point so I can tell you I can put water into a pot and put a thermometer in it and make it boil and I can measure that temperature where it's boiling that would be called its boiling point um, and so I can tell you that temperature measure it and it's still water so that makes it a physical property because it's something I can measure or observe without changing the substance um, so back to physical changes. The second type of physical change is making a mixture. And so uh, an example that I want to tell you is what, like if I added sugar to water. Now if I added sugar to water what, and I said, oh, what would you call that? And you would say, oh, sugar water. Okay, so I made a mixture, but I really didn't change the substances. Once there's not a reaction when you add sugar to water, so I'm not making anything new. I'm just making sugar water. And so making a mixture would be the second type of physical change. 
So now I have two things that are mixed together. The sugar doesn't look the same. It dissolved into the water. There's two chemicals there now, but it's just physical because I could, I could separate those back out. And my question, if we were in class, would be how could we separate the sugar from the water? And so you might think then, well, we could evaporate off the water, which would be correct. If we evaporated the water, then we'd have just the sugar left. So it's just physical. I didn't make anything new. Now, the second type of uh, property that we might consider are chemical properties. So we see here, here's the word chemical, and then we have properties. So properties, a chemical property says it determines, so it's going to describe how a substance will, re will react. Okay, so what does it mean to be react? It means that you'll convert it from one substance to another. So another way to say that is we're making something new. So a chemical property is when you uh, is a something that describes how a chemical will make something new or how it reacts. You could also argue that a chemical property might describe how it doesn't react. For example, I could say water does not burn, and that's a chemical property of water to tell you that it will not react in a certain way. Now chemical changes, and let's see what this word chemical has in in a. Uh, common so they're changed so we know there's something's going to be altering converts one substance to another also known as a chemical reaction so what do both of these chemical have in common when something's chemical it makes something new now when we're talking about chemical properties and changes um I really only make one list because the words that are involved in describing chemical properties and changes um, are the same words. Now, that might make you think, well, how am I going to determine then if it's a chemical property or a chemical change? And then what I would say to you is, that's never the question. Okay, so the question is always, determine if something's a physical property or a chemical property. So to determine if something new is formed, if it's a chemical property or nothing new is formed, if it's a physical property. Or a question could be determine if something's a physical change or a chemical change. So we're not going to have to distinguish if something's a chemical property or a change. We're going to have to decide if something's chemical or physical. So words that describe reactions, that's what we need for chemical properties and changes because that's what they describe. So sometimes it's simply words that mean that just tell us something new is happening. So it could be reacts, forms, uh, produces, makes. So sometimes it can just be words like that. Other times it can be words that tell us that a reaction is happening. It could be burn or burning or burns or burned. I don't however many. Uh, it could be a combustion. Uh, it could be rusting. It could be digestion. Uh, baking. Decomposing. Oxidation. And some of these words you might be familiar with, some of them you might not. Um, then it's all part of our process of learning and, and, and integrating new words into our, our vocabulary. It could be something like exploding. Um, you might even think of some more. And if we were in class, I would ask you to think of some more. But those are just some of the common ones that I... Um, might encounter or that we might uh, see. So you get the idea. All you're, What you're looking for is words that describe the formation of something new or a chemical reaction. So now on this third slide, I have three questions here. And these three questions ask you about the things that we've just talked about. So go ahead and pause the video and you try to get answers to these three questions and then it will you when you restart I'm going to give the answers right now. So when you restart the video, then um you can uh, check yourself to see if you're understanding. 
Okay, so question one says, indicate whether each of the following describes a gas, a liquid, or a solid. So we have to go back to that first page and, and kind of understand the differences in terms of volume, shape, and the, and the particles. So letter A, the substance has no definite volume or shape. Uh, that would be another way of saying that it takes on the shape of the container because it doesn't maintain a shape or volume. And so this would be A, gas, because gases don't have definite volumes or shapes. They take on the shapes of the container. Letter B, the particles in this substance are packed very closely together. So the best answer would probably be a solid. They, they are the closest packed. Liquids are also closely packed, but I guess if I were having to mince the words, and usually I don't try to be tricky, but the very closely, I guess, would indicate that it would be a solid. Remember, uh, solids are the closest, then liquids, and then gases are very far apart uh, relative to how small they are. And then letter C, the substance has a definite volume, okay, but it takes the shape of the container. So we know liquids keep their volume, but they'll change or transform into whatever shape the container is. They won't fill the container. Remember, that's the difference between a liquid and a gas. The, um, the liquid, since it has a definite volume, stays together and takes on whatever, however much it fills of the container, it will take on that shape, whereas a gas will completely fill the container. So it takes on the volume and the shape of the container. So question two says, classify each of the following properties, okay, as chemical or physical. So if I were to answer this question, I would think, okay, I'm looking for things, if they're chemical, something, it's going to describe something new for me. If it's physical, it's going to be something I could measure or observe without creating something new. So chromium is a steel gray solid. So I see two things it's describing here. Steel gray is a color and solid is a state. And both of those I can observe without changing it from chromium. So that's a physical property. Hydrogen reacts readily with oxygen. I see right there it's describing um, the process of hydrogen forming something new. And so that would be chemical. Nitrogen freezes at negative 210 degrees C. Well, we know that um, uh, changing states is physical, but the, also this right here, this is its freezing point. It's just telling me a temperature that it freezes at, and I could measure that without uh, changing the nitrogen. And milk will sour when left on a warm counter. So when you sour, it makes something new. You might want to drink milk, but after it's sour, it doesn't taste the same. New things are formed. And so that tells me that this must be a chemical property of milk, that a reaction will happen when I leave it on a warm counter. And I don't know on the, the last one, did I write decomposition? Oh, I did. That's a pretty common one, so I just had to check. Um, question three, classify each of the following changes. So now we're going to, it's going to describe things that are altering or, may, or you know changing as chemical or physical. Again, I know that if, if it's describing something chemical, I can identify something new that's being formed. If it's describing something physical, then I, it's going to be something that I can, um, that, that no, nothing new, it may look different, but nothing new is forming. So a silver spoon tarnishes in the air. So tarnishing, when, you're, when silver tarnishes, it actually reacts with the air to create that black uh, solid there. And so this is a chemical reaction. I can't really get the silver back once it's black. Um, if you've ever had silver, you might have to rub it off. But basically over time, you're rubbing some of the silver is going away. Food is digested, so digestion is describing a chemical process. We can think about the process of the food going through our body, and we know it creates new things. Ice melts. Melting describes one of our state changes, and state changes going from one state to another is always a physical change. And gold is hammered into thin sheets. So being uh, changing in shape, in this case thin sheets, is just physical. It would be the same like if I chopped up a piece of wood or cut up a piece of paper. I still have wood or paper uh, after. It's just they have different sizes. 
Now I will mention here because sometimes it can feel tricky, um, but let's say for example that it said a leaf turns red in the fall. So immediately you go, uh, and I'm gonna write this because it's, sometimes it's hard. Leaf turns red in fall. Now, I might think, okay, there's red and that's physical. And just looking at the leaf, the leaf as it stands right now, being red is a physical property of that leaf. But this sentence is describing a change that's occurred because it talks about turning. So when leaves turn red in the fall, that is a chemical process, right? That's a chemical change that happens. And as a result, we have a new color. So sometimes when in the description, just, just make sure, is something new forming? And in a leaf, something new forms to turn from the green color to the red color. So this is actually a chemical change. Now, if the sentence simply said, the leaf is red, then we're just describing that leaf. That's a physical property of the leaf. But if it says like the leaf turns red, sometimes you kind of have to think about it. And again, I personally, I don't try to trick you on these things, but I just want you to be aware as, as you're thinking about it, um, you know, try to think through the whole process and, and what's happening. So one other aspect of matter, so we talked about the states of matter. We talked about some of the um, properties and changes of matter. And then the other thing we can do is classify the matter. So let's take a look at this and then we'll, we'll do a question. So classification of matter. So here we have up here, this is the matter and this is everything and that's kind of what we were talking about. And when we talk about matter, we can divide it into two categories, pure substances and mixtures. So let's take a look. If something is pure, if you look here, it's composed of a single substance. Okay, so it would only have one thing there. And the composition or what it's made of is constant. So uh, let's look at some examples. What can be pure? Well, elements can be pure. Elements can be pure substances. These are the building blocks of, of matter, and they only have one kind of atom inside of them. So for example, a hydrogen atom. So if you had hydrogen, that would be an element and that would be pure all by itself. And if I had oxygen, that's another element. The symbol for oxygen is O, and the symbol for hydrogen is H. Um, the elements on the, are all found on the periodic table, which is an important part of, um, for a chemist, an important thing that a chemist uses. Uh, other pure substances that can be constant are compounds. And what happens is when elements react together, you have a chemical change, they have a reaction, and now you have two or more different elements that have come together to form a compound. Elements like to form compounds, so a lot of the things we see around us are actually compounds, not elements. So compounds, we could break them down back into their elements if we uh, did a, a, another chemical reaction. I mean, they have two or more different atoms, but they'll always have a constant composition. And let me give you an example. If I ask you the formula of water, you would say H2O. And nobody would answer anything different because water is always H2O. The compound water has a constant composition that involves the bonding of two hydrogens and one oxygen. So you see we take the elements, hydrogen and oxygen, that are when all by themselves are elements, then they react to form water. And as long as all you have is water, that would be considered a pure substance. Now, mixtures, on the other hand, uh, when we to get a mixture, if we take some pure substances and put them together, uh, not in a reaction, but just put them together, we get so what we call mixtures. So if you look here, mixtures are composed of more than one substance. 
and their composition can vary because I can add different amounts. So for example, if you're adding sugar to tea, there's not a specific amount you have to add. You could add a varying amount. You'd have a, a, a varying composition of your sweet tea. Another thing about mixtures is I could separate them back out. I could use other physical changes to get them back to their pure substances. Now, mixtures can be described in two different ways. Oh, they can be described more than two different ways, but for this first part, they can be described in two different ways as homogeneous, which means uniform, and something that might be uniform would be my example of sugar water. You can't really see that, that sugar is even in the sugar water. Or they can be heterogeneous. And something that might be heterogeneous is if I add salt and pepper together. In heterogeneous, um, the um, parts of the mixture are just a little bit larger. So when I look at them, I can see distinct regions or I can distinguish that there's more than one substance present. So let's take a look on the next page. I have a couple questions that might help you see and kind of filter out if you're understanding the definitions of these different things. So go ahead again and uh, pause the video. i uh, read these three questions and try to get answers and then come back and I'm going to answer them. So question four says, classify each of the following as a pure substance or a mixture. So remember, pure substances could be an element or a compound, but they can only contain one thing. And then mixtures are going to have two or more different things in them. So copper wire. Well, copper a copper wire would be a pure substance because it would just be copper. Now, garden soil, if you've ever seen garden soil, there's lots of different things in garden soil, and so this would be a mixture. Dish soap, okay, so we know if you look on the back, there's a long line. I know there's at least coloring, scent, and water, and dish soap. So we know if there's, as long as there's two or more different things, that's a mixture. And then sugar, sugar is a compound, actually, and so sugar is just a pure substance. It's just one thing, sugar. Now question five wants you to take the pure substances and classify them as compounds or elements because we know if they're compounds or elements, they're both considered pure substances because they only contain one type of um, substance. So the elements are the ones that contain only one kind of atom. And then the compounds um, contain two or more atoms, but they're bonded together. They only have one type of substance. So sugar is a pure substance, but it's a compound. Sugars have carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. And there's different kinds of sugars. Um, they just have different amounts of those things. Copper is an element. It's found on the periodic table. If, an, if something is not on the periodic table, then it's not considered an element. Carbon dioxide. Now I see the word carbon, and then I say, oh, there's oxide, which kind of tells me there might be oxygen. So if there's two different elements there, then I have to know that it's a compound. And then oxygen, which is on the periodic table, is an element. Now here's a really interesting thing that in chapter two we'll talk about more. But the oxygen in the air that you breathe is actually O2. Oxygen likes to go around in groups of two. It makes it a little, it's a very stable form of oxygen. We still consider this an element though. And I, in class I would say, why? Um, and you might, and you might have already thought of the answer. It's still considered an element, even though there's two, because it only contains oxygen. So anything that only has one type of atom would be considered an elemental form of that substance. Now, number six says, classify each of the following as homogeneous or heterogeneous. So homogeneous means it's uniform, right? So we're not going to be able to see the differences. Uh, heterogeneous means it has distinct regions. So sweet tea. Okay, so I can't see the, the, the I'm assuming I didn't add so much sugar. It's sitting at the bottom. This is homogeneous because I wouldn't be able to tell. Maybe you've even gone to a restaurant before and thought you were getting unsweet tea and got sweet tea, and you know. 
a granite countertop. So I put this one on purpose because sometimes we don't think of mixtures as being solids. But granite countertops are especially beautiful because we can see different components in part in the granite. So this is heterogeneous. Fruit salad, and I have to say I always think of food when I think of heterogeneous things. We can see all the different fruit that's involved. And then 14 karat gold, and again I picked a solid just so we can kind of expand what we normally think of when we're thinking of mixtures. But a 14 karat gold is not pure gold. Pure gold is very, very soft, and so they've added some different chemical, uh, some different elements in there and made a mixture. It's called an alloy, um, but it, they, uh, when you mix solids in a homogeneous mixture, you have to melt them make them molten and then mix mix them and then make them solids again um so they uh but they create this uh, uh stronger metal when they do 14 karat gold so um review this first part of the chapter there'll be subsequent videos for chapter one reviewing some of the other uh parts of chapter one